Still Aside was a commission for BBC Radio 4. They asked me to write 12 interrelated stories. Those stories also had to stand alone as separate pieces should a listener only hear one of them. I think they expected me to pitch an idea that would be set here in this landscape of West Wales where most of my stories are grounded. But for a long time I've been interested in working on an idea set in a tangible future, a place not too far away and quite recognisable, but when water is commodified. Not because there isn't any of it, but because of the management of it set against an extraordinary stress on population. And most of this population is crammed into a city, some of them just simply resident there historically, others drawn in as rising sea levels push communities away from the coast. To serve the city water, the plan is underway to drag a gigantic iceberg into the centre, into an ice dock that's being built as the story progressive. But at the moment, the, the water's brought in by train, this huge, heavily armoured train that comes down from reservoirs in the north twice a day to give drinking water to the city. I'm going to read from Lake. This is Cora's story, and she's a thermo technician on the train, and she has an afternoon off. As she stepped out, the air suddenly seemed emptied, the sharp calls of the songbirds quiet. Moments later, the sheep began to wheel on the hill. A bumblebee circled with an incongruous drone. Then the faintest sing came to the wire stays of the acomopods, and the valley filled with the sound of the train starting up. By the time Cora reached the foot of the hill, the sound was no more than a lessening hush, fading towards the city hundreds of miles away. Cora's dress stuck a little to her skin. Delicate yellow day-flying moths flew amongst the gorse. There was a heady coconut smell to the flowers. She picked them and dropped them into the bowl, patient when she pinned her finger, sometimes felt showered seeds on her skin. It took a while to link the tickle to the spiky sporadic pops, punctuations in the air as the flat mature pea pods on the bushes burst in the sun. She gently pinched the part-closed petals together and pulled, took soft buds, the faint hairs between her fingers like stroking a small animal's ear. Below her, in the bowl of the valley, the foil of the acomopods gleamed like mica. The tech buildings looked no bigger than the squat low boxes of the bumblebee hive she passed on her way up the hill. Every now and then, there was a quiet bump of rabbits. She was at the same time a long way away and very here, deeply thoughtful, but content. Her mind went easily from one thing to another. Rested sometimes, waited, flitted. She thought of Leo. She thought of lunch. She thought of raw grated carrot fresh from the nearby farm, the difference the new farm being here had made. As had the chickens the crew had decided to take on, managing the care by rota and sharing out the eggs. The veg patch they had not quite got to grips with yet. Thought of how dry the grass was and how she should have put on sun lotion. And then suddenly, they were there. She jumped, hard and jolting, a horrible zip through her system. The two guards stood above her, stepped from the thorn. Cora felt sick. She had jumped hard enough to spill gorse around her feet. She followed the gaze of one of the guards, who looked at the flowers on the ground. When she looked back, he held her eye. Farm? he said. No, I'm with the train. I'm off shift she felt the need to say. She wished she had her pass, as if it could protect her, as if it could ward them off. What are you doing up here? asked the guard. I'm making ice cream, said Cora. It made no sense. The guard stared at the bowl of flowers in her hand, the flowers dropped around her feet, her walking boots, her legs. The thinner guard reviewed her with strange, unbatting eyes. I've seen you, I've noticed you, he said, and it felt as if his eyes rolled into the bowl of her mouth. Cora felt an animal certainty that there were more men than there really were. Her dress clung to her sweat. She felt it outline her, present her. You should not be up here, said the first guard. The locus of her fear changed to a fear they were going to mete out punishment. There are people up here, 
the guard continued. They have intent. It's why we're here. You can't be up here. Cora felt the eyes of the thinner guard in the soft shallow of her neck. Have you not read the directives? Best go back, said the first guard. Cora could not stop the shake. It set the gorse buds rattling in the bowl. We'll pretend this didn't happen. <laughs>